I'm Chair Mike Sundin, Chairman of the Ag Finance Committee. This is Wednesday, March 10th. It's uh, 1.46 p.m. Uh, I'm gonna call a committee to order. Good afternoon. This meeting will be held in accordance with Rule 10.01. A roll call, Mr. Smith, please. Chair Sundin. Here. Sundin, present, Vice Chair Vang. Present. Bang present. Representative Anderson. Anderson here. Anderson present. Representative Burkle. Present. Burkle present. Representative Eckland. Present. Eckland present. Representative Hansen R. Hansen R present. Hansen R present. Representative Hansen J. Hansen J present. Hansen J present. Representative Cleavorn. Present. Cleavorn present. Representative Lippert. Lippert present. Present Lewick. Representative Lewick, present. Lewick, present. Representative Miller. Miller. Representative Nelson. Nelson, present. Nelson, present. Representative Thompson. Thompson, present. Thompson, present. We have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, you have the minutes of the previous meeting in front of you. Uh, Representative Nelson, would you uh, have a motion? Yes, I'd move the minutes of the previous meeting. Thank you. Are there any questions or corrections? Hearing none, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Okay, this motion prevails. The minutes are adopted. Uh, we have a handful of bills uh, on the agenda today. We're running a little bit uh, behind with uh, people's schedules. Hopefully we'll have time for good discussion on these bills. We will finish up uh, the uh, uh, department uh, policy bill, get a quick update from, uh, from the department on COVID vaccine news and then move on to the rest. With that, uh, Vice Chair, uh, would you like to assume the chair? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have House Ballot 1898. Um, and House Bill 1898 was heard on Monday, March 8th, and it was laid over. So I will bring uh, it back before the committee and move it that I'd be recommended to be placed on the agenda register. Um, Chair Sundin, please proceed. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have one, one uh, author's amendment uh, and I'd like to move the A1 amendment. Okay, so Mr. Chair um, uh, moves the A1 amendment. Um, do you want to explain the amendment before we? Uh... I, I will, thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, amendment makes the changes the uh, department discussed uh, during their walkthrough of the bill on Monday. The amendment deletes the mental health data portion of the bill, that's section one, to prevent this bill from having to go to judiciary and civil law and renumbers the sections and amends the title accordingly. So. Uh, this is a time-saving, uh, labor-saving uh, issue, and uh, the uh, privacy issues can be taken up next year. There's no immediate, uh, no sense of immediacy on that. Okay. Any discussion on the amendment, A1 amendment? Okay. Seeing no questions, uh, the A1 amendment is, is before us. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The motion prevails and the A1 amendment is adopted. There are no other amendments to consider, so uh, we can open this uh, to testify um, on Monday. Um, any closing comments, Chair Sandin, before you renew the motion? No, uh, thank you. It's just a pleasure to uh, bring forth these bills and have cooperation from uh, a very amiable committee. Much appreciated. Uh, so I'd uh, renew my motion that uh, House File 1898, as amended, be recommended to be in the general register. Okay, the motion is before us. Uh, Mr. Smith, please call the vote. Chair Sundin? Aye. Sundin, aye. Vice Chair Vang? Aye. Vang, aye. Representative Anderson? Anderson, aye. Anderson, aye. Representative Burkle? Burkle, aye. 
Circle I, Representative Eklund. I. Eklund I, Representative Hanson R. Hanson R, I. Hanson R, I. Representative Hanson J. J, I. Hanson J, I. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn I. Cleborn I, Representative Lippert. Lippert I. Lippert I, Representative Lewick. Lewick I. Lewick I, Representative Miller. Miller I. Miller I, Representative I. Nelson. Nelson I. Nelson I, Representative Thompson. Thompson I. Thompson I. 13 ayes, zero nays. On a vote of 13 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails and the bill as amended will head to the floor. Uh, next up, we have, um, we wanna spend a couple minutes uh, getting a quick update from the Department of Ag on vaccine news for ag workers. Uh, we have reserved a few minutes for Dep Deputy Commissioner Vobel. Uh, would you like to comment and please state your, your name for the record and please proceed. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. My name is Andrea Vobel. I serve as Deputy Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Um, and as part of my duties, I'm also helping out with uh, the COVID-19 response. Um, I was working on testing most of last year and then uh, now helping out with the vaccine rollout for food and ag workers. So uh, I am not a public health professional, but have been um, working on, on the operations and logistics of it. So uh, I was just asked to do a quick update on where we're at um, with, with all things vaccine. And I'll just, uh, I'll run through it pretty quickly. Um, I have some background on it that most of you may already know, but um, just to get us all on the same page. So I'm just gonna share my screen. You can just let me know if you see it. Got it. Awesome. Okay. So um, as most of you know, it's, it's been, you know, worldwide news. Um, last week, the uh, FDA did grant emergency use authorization for the COVID-19 vaccine uh, developed by Johnson Johnson, otherwise called Janssen. Um, it is a one dose vaccine compared to the two for Pfizer and Moderna um, and is 100% effective at preventing death in persons 18 and older. It has been a, a significant piece in the acceleration of the timeline on vaccine rollout. So we're very thankful. It, it certainly has been a game changer um, for all of us here in the state. So uh, doses started uh, arriving last Wednesday from Johnson & Johnson. Um, you might've seen that we did set up a community vaccination program site at the Vikings practice facility in Egan with over 13,000 doses. That was aimed for uh, those in the 65 plus category and 1A healthcare workers. And then the remaining doses went out to vaccinators in the area who could help meet the, the timeliness goals of the, the 72 hour rule. We also have uh, about four other community vaccination program state run clinics that are set up, one in Duluth, one in uh, Rochester, one in um, Minneapolis and one in St. Paul. And uh, we have been in the top 10 for almost two weeks and we're currently at the, the number two spot for doses administered as a percentage of doses delivered to the state per the CDC. You might have seen uh, that we do have some new tools on the vaccine dashboard that the Department of Health houses. Um, it was keeping up on the percentage of 65 plus with at least one dose. As you know, the governor was hoping to get to 70% before moving to the next phases, which we did uh, reach. And then there's also an update on the race ethnicity data. And there's a tab specifically for that. So I, I, I do urge you to take a look at that when you have a chance. Um, so we did release more detailed guidance for uh, the next phases after the 65 plus group um, that did include type one diabetes was included in the list of underlying medical conditions, people with rare conditions and disabilities, and then, um, and then gave some guidance about providers considering the presence of multiple risk factors when they're sub prioritizing. We also have a tool called the vaccine connector, which we're hoping all folks and all Minnesotans will take a look at if they can and sign up. Almost 650,000 Minnesotans have signed up for it already. It does ask several questions um, and uh, gets, gets the information to you once you have become eligible and where you are able to access vaccine. So from the federal side of things, the Biden administration directed the federal retail pharmacy program partners that they have. Those are Walmart, Thrifty White, High and High V to begin vaccinating teachers. As you know, um, we were already well, well underway on vaccinating teachers and childcare workers here in Minnesota. So for us to date, at least 55% of teachers and childcare workers have, gotten, have received at least one dose. 
Uh, the Biden administration also announced a commitment to provide sufficient supply to vaccinate every adult by the end of May um, by finalizing an agreement with Johnson & Johnson for 100 million doses by the end of June, which is great news. And then um, they're looking to, they're, they are making it able so that vaccinators have a four week floor for allocations, allowing for planning. Um, so it is, you know, the allocation conversations are happening each week uh, and it's difficult to plan out how many doses we'll be getting in subsequent weeks. So this will help us in the long-term planning of our, our rollout. So um, as I mentioned, we are expected or have reached the 70% 70, 70 threshold of 65 plus with at least one dose. And so um, currently, as of right now, those who are eligible, they will remain eligible through. So if, if they have not received a vaccine yet, it doesn't mean that they, their eligibility status has gone away. They remain eligible. So long-term care residents and staff, people with disabilities in congregate settings, people age 65 plus, frontline healthcare workers, including primary caregivers, B12 educators and child care professionals. And then um, we also, so the tier two, which is uh, was just opened up by the governor and he, he announced this yesterday along with tier three, but tier two, uh, it does include people with specific underlying health conditions, things like sickle cell disease, Down syndrome, chronic lung health or, or heart conditions, um, or those in active cancer treatment. It's also for people with rare conditions or disabilities that put them at a higher risk and then food processing plant workers. Uh, the governor felt very strongly about that uh, because they were, as we all know, disproportionately affected by outbreaks because of the nature of their work in uh, food processing plants last year. And it's uh, really necessary for them to, to be safe and protected and have uh, a chance to have access to the vaccine. So uh, tier three was opened up at the same time as tier two. The reason for that being, um, we were finding that local public health, they are amazing individuals who are able to get out vaccine pretty, pretty quickly. Um, some of the areas of the state did not have as many of the phase two individuals as other locations. So we wanted to provide some flexibility so that once they did get through that tier two, they could go immediately to tier three without having to wait for that eligibility requirement to open up. So tier three does include people age 45 and older with one or more underlying medical condition, uh, people age 16 and over with two or more underlying health conditions, and you'll see uh, those are listed below, people age 50 plus in multi-generational housing, and then the big one for, for food and ag is the essential frontline workers. And so this does open up the rest of, of the food and ag uh, um, industry. So we have the agricultural folks, airport staff, childcare workers, correctional settings, first responders. It does include all of food production, food retail, um, so all of the grocery stores, as well as food service, um, manufacturing, and public transit, amongst others. So that's where we are right now. Um, we have just worked on the allocation numbers for next week, and um, it's looking really good about a number of employers who have partnered with their local public health uh, entities to make sure that they're ready and, and can uh, vaccinate their employees on site. Um, and then also opening up eligibility for those retail pharmacies has been helpful because now those who are in those eligible uh, categories can now go to a, a retail facility that does have, uh, have supply. We are still finding that um, the demand still uh, still exceeds supply, but, um, but we're getting closer and closer and uh, things, are, things are moving much more rapidly than we, we anticipated. So I went through that really quickly, but I just um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, um, Commissioner, uh, Assistant Commissioner Vobel. Uh We do have very limited time, uh, but I do see one hand is up. So uh, uh, Representative Anderson, I'll accept that one question and then we'll move uh, forward to our next item on the agenda. Uh, Representative Anderson. Um, thank you, I kind of messed up my... Oh, Representative Anderson, you're muted. I should know better, thank you, sorry about that. Um, Commissioner Vabo, thank you for the update. Uh, zeroing in on food processing workers, I assume you're talking about folks working at some of the major processing plants. What have you got set up in terms of how we're gonna uh, get to those folks quickly? And also then, does this also include the, the mom and pop shops in our small towns? Will those folks also be eligible now then to get the shots along with those that work at, at the major plants? Yes, thank you, uh, Representative Anderson and, and Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. So um, yes, the, the uh, mom and pop shops who are in food processing would also be eligible. We're really trying to get to the folks that have to work indoors, uh, cannot work from home, 
and are um, needed to you know, keep the food supply chain going. So um, we have pulled a list based upon our licensing data and have worked with Department of Health and local public health entities to um, do some matchmaking if necessary. We found that a lot of the food processors did already have some pre-existing relationships, um, some with the, the retail uh, pharmacy folks like Hy-Vee um, and then others who did have close relations, relationships with their local public health directors and, and agencies um, who were ready and, and happy to schedule site visits and, um, and, and get folks vaccinated as soon as possible. So we anticipate a, a large number of food processing workers to be, to be vaccinated next week. Okay, thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, you know, members, we did not reserve a lot of time for questions. And so I will ask the members if we do have questions to follow up directly with Deputy Commissioner Vobel. Uh, we do have um, uh, a busy schedule today. So I want to apologize and thank you, uh, Commissioner Vobel, for, for your time and for the updates. Uh, I feel like this is, we're finally reaching, but feeling like the, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So I uh, will keep an eye on this. Um, and with that, I'll return the gavel to uh, Chair Sendeen. Thank you, Vice Chair Vang. Uh, just a, a personal comment here uh, regarding to, uh, in regards to uh, Commissioner Vobble. Uh, uh, about a week or so ago, I cut you short in committee. I, I think that was rude of me. And uh, I just wanted to say that your input in this committee is always welcome and valued. That said, House file, 1687 bang uh it's an agriculture cooperative grant program provided and rulemaking authorized we've got uh 20 minutes uh allocated for this uh representative bang thank you uh, mr chair um i'm here today to present uh 1687 so this bill uh what we authorize mda to make grants to help uh, producers develop cooperatives to process and market Minnesota grown agriculture products. This language mirrors a program that used to be in the statute at MDA. It's timely now and it's important that we bring this program back for two reasons. First, because Minnesota farmers are growing new, often high value crop, for which the market and the supply chain is still emerging. Producer led cooperatives can help these producers develop the processing and marketing infrastructure needed to grow the market for these crops. I work with many producers who are growing hemp, for example, a key challenge for them is finding processing. If these farmers had support to form cooperatives, they could come together and build some of that processing capacity for themselves. This value added work can also help producers earn more money for their products. Second, cooperative development is timely because many producers are becoming frustrated. Consolidate, uh, co consolidation in our food system uh, and want to build alternative models. This is particularly true in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, cooperatives are an important tool that producers can use to build alternative markets for the farm products. There is also a lack of uh, local meat processing, for example, um, that has been raised in this committee. I know there are local producers who are thinking about ways they could start cooperative, co cooperatively own slaughter facilities. And finally, you'll notice this bill does not have a dollar amount attached to it. Um, that's because the Agri program already supports such uh, important work. It's not my intention to take away from that. Instead, this leaves the funding up to the commissioner in case money becomes available. Uh, my hope is that if the federal money becomes available for economic recovery, we could direct some of it to the program. Um, and finally, the cooperative development is a tool we can use to help produce Minnesota producers innovate and build new models that could better serve their farm businesses and communities. And Mr. Chair, I also have a DE1 amendment. Um, this- uh, th Thank you, Representative Vang. Did you uh, actually move your, uh, the 1687? Uh, no, I, I would like to move the uh, 6 D 1687 DE1 amendment. Yeah, we have the 1687 before us. Uh, that, that, that has been moved. Uh, uh and now we'll go to the de1 uh so you're you're gonna move the de1 then yes i, I move uh to um uh, place it before the committee uh the de1 amendment is uh basically it, it just references a different part of the law because uh we we saw there was a fiscal note attached that with a small cost of forty six thousand dollars for small rulemaking and so uh, we decided to I'll reference um, this uh, this 
reference this to a different section of law to avoid the need to undergo rulemaking and incur the associated uh, expenses. Okay, the committee has the DE1 amendment uh, before us uh, uh, and, and explained. Uh, all those in favor of the DE1 uh, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Say nay. Okay, the motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Uh, there are no other amendments uh, submitted. Vice Chair Vang, let's hear from your presenters. They each have two minutes. Uh, uh, Mr. Smith will kindly throw the hook to him after two minutes. Mr. Ben Penner, Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Sundin, and Vice Chair Vang, and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Ben Penner uh, from Ben Penner Farms. And I am the vice president of the Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative, and I live in St. Peter. Um, I'm honored to be here today to testify in support of Representative Bang's bill to reauthorize cooperative development grants at the MDA. And these grants would help us to launch our new cooperative. Uh, the Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative, or Perennial Promise, is farmer led and will provide direction and assistance to farmers interested in growing and marketing Kernza. Uh, perennial Promise will help commercialize ecosystem services from perennial and other continuous living cover crops, such as Kernza, uh, Winter Camelina, Pennycrest, and similar Forever Green Initiative crops by expanding the number of acres dedicated to these crops. Working closely with growers, Perennial Promise will provide assistance in planting, growing, harvesting, marketing, and by providing logistical and processing network services and expertise for scaling up Kernza and related crops. Uh, the cooperative will work closely with the University of Minnesota as well as other private and public entities to develop markets, networks, and relationships to develop new varieties of Kernza and expand the commercial viability of Kernza and other perennial crops throughout their scale up process uh, and commercialization process. Uh, we plan to assist in the development of other agronomic aspects of perennial agriculture, such as ecosystem and climate positive aspects of this sweet crop. Some uh, quick key characteristics, it's farmer led, currently led by a steering committee of six currents of growers in Minnesota, one in Wisconsin, uh, closely aligned with the uh, University of Minnesota and research agronomists and the Forever Green Initiative. Uh, we seek to become a hub of networking, price discovery, product development and agronomic and technical assistance with a focus on ecosystem services, and we want to bring value back to the grower, back to the communities where the crop is grown, and to the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mia Ulysse. Please identify yourself and uh, continue with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. I'm pleased to be able to testify on this bill today. My name is Mia Ulysse, and I am uh, testifying on behalf of 40 Acre Cooperative. We are a grower cooperative that is located in Samstone, Minnesota, that reaches uh, beyond and to the state of Minnesota. And we focus on Black farmers and finding ways to increase market reach and opportunity for Black farmers to take advantage of hemp production and other specialty crops. As you might have heard from other testifiers and past bills, Minnesota is really leading the way in hemp research. And I think that there's a great opportunity that we have in the state of Minnesota to be able to build up and establish um, relationships across the country around hemp production for fiber, for grain, and for DVD and other purposes. So I think that it's really telling for us to be able to provide opportunities for the Department of Agriculture to send out grants to farming cooperatives that are trying to lift off their businesses. As you might know, Minnesota has the highest rate of cooperatives, whether it's consumer or farmer cooperatives per capita in the country. And so it's really indicative of the culture of agriculture that we have here in the state of Minnesota of finding opportunities for us to connect our farmers to opportunities for distribution, opportunities for processing and marketing opportunities. We are a relatively new cooperative. And so a lot of the challenges that we are facing are around making sure that we can secure funding for processing. Um, it's not necessarily the same as processing carrots or processing cucumbers, hemp production and processing has to um, 
be in a very specific facility. There are obviously legal requirements and um, policies that we have to abide by to make sure that we are not um, sending out or selling uh, content that has a high level of THC. And this can be a significant barrier for farmers that are trying to take uh, advantage of accessing this new and budding industry. And by having opportunities like this from the Department of Agriculture in the future, it would allow us to be able to uh, our membership base and provide opportunities for them to be able to process their uh, product. And we are working on a mobile hemp processing facility as we speak right now and are forming relationships across the country so that when our farmers are getting to the point of harvesting, they can actually uh, send their hemp in for processing and be able to take advantage financially of the opportunities that the hemp industry is um, producing for our farmers. So thank you for your time. I'm really excited with this opportunity, especially because it doesn't have a financial appropriation. And I think it's an opportunity for us all to show our support for cooperatives in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Okay, next up we have uh, Stuart Laurie with the uh, Minnesota Farmers Union. Please identify yourself and, uh, and utilize your time allotted. Thank you, Chair Sundin and members of the committee. I will, uh, for the record, my name is Stu Laurie. I'm the government relations director for Minnesota Farmers Union, and I'll work to be very brief so I don't get the hook from, from, from Kyle here. Uh, just want to share our support for this legislation, you know, and talking to members, I think they're excited about initiatives like this, you know, particularly in the wake of COVID-19, when uh, our food system was stressed, producers are excited about uh, building new models that can serve them better, serve their communities better, and, and cooperatives are one way to do that. So uh, thank you for the time and, and happy to answer any questions. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, now I have time to tell a story about when once I introduced your uh, grandmother at an event and uh, told everyone that we uh, allotted the next 45 minutes for a five minute speech from Becky Laurie. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, no one else has signed up to testify. Are there any questions for the witnesses or the author at this time? Going once, going twice. Okay. Chair Sundin. Sure. Sure. Representative yes. Anderson has a question. Okay, I don't see hands here on, on my screen. Representative Anderson, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. Um, had a question for the lady testifying from the 40 acre cooperative. She had a very good testimony. Just a quick question. Ma'am, you uh, mentioned. You, you'll see. Are you available yet? Yeah. Okay. Go I'm ahead. Uh, Representative Anderson. Thanks for your testimony. It was very interesting. Now, just to, to clear up, your co op has already been formed, correct? So are you looking to use this bill to form another co op or? What is the situation? Ms. Ulysses? Great question. Yes, uh, Representative Anderson, our cooperative has already been established. We were established in 2019. So we are definitely still in the early development stages of our cooperative. Okay. Follow up, Mr. Chair? Please, Representative Anderson. Um, uh, not trying to get down to dollars and pennies, but any idea what, what your startup costs were, you know, legal fees, things like that? I notice in the bill here, there's a, there's a cap of $50,000. Uh, I would assume these are, are, are smaller co-ops and that figure seems uh, kind of high. So just wonder if, if you have any idea what the, what the costs for your co-op were to uh, organize. And if you don't want to share secrets, I totally get that. But just trying to get a handle on, on what some of the costs are. Absolutely. In absolute honesty, I have been with 40 Acre as an organizational development consultant for the last year. And so I am not fully aware of the cost for their startup in the very beginning stages. But I will say that that is a small drop in the bucket of what is required to establish a cooperative. Uh, you have legal fees and you have the time that it takes for people to come together. A lot of um, cooperatives don't get into the, the fully operational stage for about eight to 10 years. And so I think that having a grant would have a significant impact because a lot of cooperatives string themselves along for a long time because they don't have the opportunity to take advantage of a grant like this. And so I think that this would allow for a quicker startup phase for new cooperatives to be able to access those funds. Um, even processing equipment is extremely expensive um, 
one processing facility that's not mobile could be into the millions just for the development. And so, yeah, this is like drops in the buckets, but would really make a huge difference for cooperatives that are in those very beginning baby stages to be able to lift off and start walking. Okay. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Uh, uh, no other questions. There was a fiscal note completed on the bill as in introduced with uh, uh, delete all amendment. We'll need to see if a revised note uh, will be needed before the omnibus bill is put together. Uh, seeing no further discussion, Representative Vang, do you care to renew your motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just want to thank uh, committee members for the time to hear this bill. Uh, and therefore, I renew my motion that House File 1687, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Ag Finance Bill. Thank you, Vice Chair Vang. House File 1687 is laid over. Next up is Representative Thompson. House File 1543 regarding hand sanitizer licensing. Uh, House file 1543, uh, the commercial pesticide applicator licensing exemption provided for sanitizer and disinfectant use. Uh, Representative Thompson, I understand this bill that it's time sensitive, so it needs to travel separately. Representative Thompson, your first bill for the committee, please uh, move your bill and begin. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I move the House file 1543 be recommended to be placed on the general register. Um, also have an author's amendment to get the bill in shape that I like to present it. So I, I also move that uh, A1 amendment. Um, that I move the A1, A1 amendment. Okay, the A1 move, uh, amendment has been uh, moved. Uh, do you have a explanation or would you like to defer to the department? So those the the A one it has the uh, as of now just putting the dates, just changing the date. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, no other amendments were submitted. Uh, let's see, we can uh, we can vote on the A one amendment. Uh, all those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, say nay. Nay. <laughs> Motion prevails, amendment is adopted. No further amendments were submitted. Representative Thompson, uh, let's continue with your presentation and hear from your witnesses. I understand we have uh, presenting today, Whitney Place, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, Whitney Place, uh, would you introduce yourself to the committee and uh, proceed with your testimony? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thanks so much um, to Representative Thompson for carrying this bill. Um, in the COVID package, we, ex we exempted um, license category for antimicrobial products, specifically for those who were applying these products as it related to COVID-19. Um, we had an end date in that exemption of April 1st, 2021, which we're coming up to. Um, I don't think any of us anticipated how long this pandemic would be lasting. And so what we're asking for is the continuation of that exemption specifically for these applicators who are um, applying these products in public buildings, schools, airplanes, things like that, um, as it pertains to COVID-19. So thanks so much again to uh, Representative Thompson and, and we thank you all for your support. Uh, are there any other testifiers? Hearing none, seeing none. Any questions for the witness or uh, Whitney Place from the committee? Okay, hearing none, seeing none. Uh, Mr. Chair. Note. Oh, okay. Representative Hansen has a question. I don't know why I'm not seeing this stuff. Representative Hansen, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Representative Thompson for bringing the bill forward. Uh, I don't know if you know, I used to actually uh, run this provision or these pro uh, programs at the Department of Agriculture a very long time ago. I see this place is smiling. Uh, it was a long time ago. Uh, but this is important, uh, important stuff. So I think uh, extending this, I know for the airport, for Delta uh, and the airplanes of providing for this, uh, it's important for the workers out there and uh, to make sure that they can keep getting uh, things safe uh, for 
people using the planes and for themselves. So thank you for bringing this forward and I'm gonna co-author your bill. Okay, uh, any other comments uh, for the author? Okay, seeing no further discussion, Representative Thompson, do you care to renew your motion? Yes, Chair, thank you. So there's nothing else I have, uh, Chair. Okay, Tom, uh, Representative Thompson renews his motion that 1543 as amended be recommended to be placed on the general register. The motion is before us, Mr. Smith, please call the vote. Chair Sundin. Aye. Sundin, aye. Vice Chair Vang. Aye. Vang, aye. Anderson. Aye. Anderson, aye. Representative Burkle. Aye. Burkle, aye. Representative Eklund. Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hansen R. Hansen R, aye. Hansen R, aye. Representative Hansen J. Hansen J, aye. Hansen J, aye. Representative Cleavorn. Aye. Cleavorn, aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert, aye. Representative Lippert, aye. Representative Lewick. Lewick, aye. Lewick, aye. Representative Miller. Miller, aye. Miller, aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Thompson. Thompson, aye. Thompson, aye. 13 ayes, zero nays. On a vote of 13 0, the motion prevails and the bill as amended will head to the floor. Thank you very much, Representative Thompson. Uh, next up is Rep Representative Petersburg with uh, House File 1830 regarding peace. We have 15 minutes blocked for this. Uh, Representative, Representative Anderson, would you like to uh, do the honors of moving the bill for the author? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, I would like to move House File 1830 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Ag Finance Bill. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Uh, House File 1830 has been moved. Uh, it uh, deals with local food promotion, event, education, event funding provided and money appropriated. Uh, the bill is before us. Welcome to the committee, Representative Petersburg. Please begin your presentation and, and let's hear from your witnesses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for hearing this bill and thank you, committee, for hearing it as well. And, and to uh, Representative Anderson for, for moving the bill. Uh, this bill, for those of you that have been on committee in the past, uh, you've heard this bill before. It's a, a grant program uh, that we do every two years uh, for the Southern Minnesota Initiative Foundation to kind of be the fiscal agent for a, a really good program that provides opportunities for farmers and marketers of products to meet with um, um, customers and consumers and it's kind of a food to market uh, type program uh, that is done in Rochester each year. One year it's educational, one year it's more a direct connection. And just to give you a small story about how effective it is, um, one of the first years that it was held, a local lady who owns a, a candy shop um, and she learned making candy by her grandmother and decided to uh, go into business. She uh, joined it, uh, made some great connections and within a few years, uh, she was actually uh, allowed to be one of the candy vendors up at the uh, uh, Super Bowl that was held up here in Minneapolis. And so she's really growing the business and kind of specializes in sugar-free candy as well. So it's a great program to, to do this. So uh, it is currently in the um, department's budget as well as the governor's budget, but it's not part of the base because it's a, it's a just two-year grant program and so we need to kind of always review it to see if it's still uh, effective. And, and right now I believe it is. Uh, so I have two testifiers here, uh, Tim Penny, who runs the um, Southern Minnesota Initiative Foundation, a former Congressman from Southern Minnesota, does a great job in, in what he does. Uh, he wasn't able to be here, but we have two um, testifiers. And I think uh, Ms. Conley, if you want to put up the, the slide, uh, they will talk to it. So we have Pam Bishop and Jan, I'm not going to sure. I'm going to say this way, uh, Joanitis. Uh, so I will turn it over to them. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Sundin and committee members. My name is Pam Bishop. I'm the uh, Vice President of Economic Development at the Southern Minnesota Initiative Foundation. And we are really pleased to be with you today because as Representative Petersburg discussed and shared with you, FEAST has been a longstanding 
uh, convening uh, event and, and, and a festival uh, that we've been proud to be a part of. We've been partners with the Minnesota Department of Ag and renewing the countryside for the last seven years since the uh, conference event has taken place in Rochester. And, and FEAST really does engage the local food producers from across uh, rural Minnesota and not just solely uh, southern, our southern region. Um, in fact, uh, things we are proud of in terms of what it's been able to produce, and that story was great, that in fact was Curly Girls, a uh, chocolate candies who's now in Owatonna. It really does increase the awareness of local foods. We know that local foods continues to be a driver in many of our small towns in terms of producing strong economies. And this is one way that we can help advance those early stage producers and makers who are really vying for market opportunities uh, and build connections with food institutions um, across the state and across the country, really. Um, you might think of this as the farmer's market on steroids. Um, if you've ever been to the festival, you'll notice that we have over close to 100 vendors each year um, and over 1,500 consumers that walk into the show and taste and sample and purchase the products from mm -hmm. the vendors. Uh, it's so important to get to know the people who are making our food, and this gives them the time to walk the aisle, introduce themselves, folks get familiar with where their food is coming from, who is making it, and it also introduces them to buyers, uh, individuals who are looking for ways to enhance their food products on their shelves. Um, and it also gets them acquainted with other institutions who are looking for food suppliers. The trade show is another key component to this event. It provides an educational opportunity for uh, business owners to get uh, better situated to have those conversations. And in, in most cases, uh, the vendors are telling us they're looking for future sales. They wanna build out their market opportunities and this gives them introductory opportunity to do so. They're looking to build their brand. They're looking at networking. Networking continues to be a big part of this event. They're gathering uh, ways to build their business skills and these uh, trade shows um, help with that. And this also helps them do market research they can see who else is out there with similar products. And in some cases, we've helped folks build collaborative opportunities. We'll also say the scale of, of who's showing up in terms of our exhibitors is changing. Uh, we have several exhibitors who represent strong minority populations, including people of color, and several of them are co-owned by women entrepreneurs. We have over 300 unique vendors that have represented various components of the food uh, production uh, supply chain uh, since we started this festival. And uh, we're just so hopeful that you'll continue to support this as you have in the past years. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And the next testifier is? Um, this is Jan Joannitas from Renewing the Countryside. And thank you so much, Chair and uh, committee members for having this opportunity. Um, Pam and I work very, very close uh, together along with a number of others to um, work on not just the event, uh, the festival and the trade show, but we really see this as part of a, um, a region-wide effort to build local food economy in greater Minnesota. Um, the event really started off of research that was done that identified among producers, uh, both food makers and smaller scale farmers where they were having um, lack of access to markets, uh, especially in more rural areas. Um, often uh, the demand for the, uh, their products were from the Twin Cities area, which was great, but they also would have loved to have sold that um, uh, bacon or, <laughs> uh, you know, jams into their local communities, into their local grocery stores, uh, into the local restaurants. So this effort has really uh, had multi-pronged approaches with the kind of key pieces of it being this, this public event which really uh, not only includes the, the one day festival um, that this year we held uh, a little more uh, in COVID time. So it was a, it was a drive-through uh, festival, festival with online uh, opportunities for people to engage. Um, but it also includes um, 
a lot of media and outreach that's done across the region telling stories of these different food makers and farmers and how they're bringing food um, into their uh, food system. Uh, the last three years, and I will hold this up here, um, we've also could produce this Feast Local Foods magazine, uh, which showcases stories uh, of the farmers and food makers. Uh, um, Commissioner uh, Bailey is is uh, our our front front story. Uh, Patrice Bailey is our front story in in this last year's uh, volume. The trade show piece, which Pam talked some about, is partly education, so providing training to uh, food entrepreneurs, whether it's food safety training, whether it's information on marketing, we always do uh, surveys and gather information from them in order to get uh, ideas of what would be most useful. And then we bring in different speakers. Um, we also provide time for them to network with each other, to talk to, uh, to wholesale and retail buyers. Uh, so it's really a, a way for them to learn. Uh, we also then have uh, normally not this year, but we normally have the trade show open for just buyers. So just wholesale buyers where we have everyone from, um, you know, small, um, small and mid-sized restaurants to the Minneapolis uh, public school food system services come down multiple years to uh, food co-ops, to grocery stores, uh, to uh, hospitals who come and get to go through that, uh, that same uh, hall where they get to taste the different products and talk to the different uh, food makers. Um, the the follow-up surveys we've received from buyers uh, always say that they'll, they're planning on picking up two or three products. And um, let's see, as of in 2019, 60% uh, of them said they would, they would be picking up four to six products for their shelves. Uh, uh, and then 6% said so they would do 10 to 15 products. So uh, many of the makers who have been involved in this have, have pointed to this show as a way to get into their local high V and to get into um, other systems that they hadn't had an opportunity to. Um, if, if you're not familiar with this space, there are there there are there are huge food shows, but they're on the coasts. They're uh, in in California in New York. Um, and uh, the Minnesota Department of Ag does provide uh, assistance to help uh, food makers go to those shows. But those shows really are for, for businesses that are um, one step up from a lot of the businesses that we have. Um, uh, some of the businesses that have been at Feast have gone on to, to go on that next level, um, but those uh, national shows really are looking for, you know, kind of nationwide distribution, which requires a scaling up of businesses. Uh, so we see this as a really important piece of, um, of the food systems puzzle in Minnesota by providing opportunities for, for smaller scale food makers and farmers to um, build their businesses. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions uh, for, for the witnesses or the author? Okay. Uh, hearing none, seeing none, uh, no di further discussion is necessary. Uh, Representative Petersburg, uh, before you offer closing comments, you are one of the more senior legislators uh, in this uh, meeting today. And, uh, you know, I, I think. Uh, I think it would be uh, appropriate for you to uh, carry on with some of the traditions that we've seen in the agriculture uh, committee where candy samples or vegetable samples or candy samples are distributed or, or candy samples. Uh, so I don't know, you, you could always uh, check with the uh, committee administrator on uh, room numbers and uh, delivery possibilities. So just, just throwing it out there for you. So. Uh, any closing comments, uh, Representative Petersburg? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, you know, I'm in my office, so you, you know, I, as soon as I see people start coming back to the offices, I'll I'll try to make sure I have some of that available because we have a couple of different good candy stores that make homemade candies in in Oatana as well. But in closing, uh, Mr. Chair, in all seriousness, this this program and this grant program has been very effective over the years, and I know that uh, Mr. Penny is in constant contact with. Uh, Peter Jesseth from from the department as well, and um, uh, it's it's a program that has really proven that its effectiveness 
and um, is, is worthy, I think, also of duplication in other parts of the state as well. But I just ask your support for continuing the, um, the grant for $25,000 a year. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Peterson, uh, Petersburg. Uh, Representative Anderson, would you like to renew the motion? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to renew my motion that House File 1830 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Ag Finance Bill. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Petersburg and uh, Representative Anderson for the motion. Uh, hearing that, uh, House File 1830 is laid over. Next up is uh, House File 2037, Vice Chair Bang. Can you take the gavel again? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, feel free to move your bill whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, uh, I move uh, 2037 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Ag Finance Bill. Okay, the bill is before us. Please begin your presentation and let's hear um, from your witnesses afterwards. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, we have, have uh, Shannon Schlett from ARI, the ex Executive Director, to speak on the bill. Um, Ms. Shannon Schlett, please feel free to proceed. Say your name and proceed uh, with your testimony. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. <laughs> Shannon Schlett, the Executive Director. Uh, of the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today to uh, uh, talk about this bill and its importance to the, the industry. I think as we all know, uh, livestock is a major um, uh, contributor uh, to our agricultural economy and, and to the industry. Uh, and ARI, we've typically um, had a meat scientist on staff to assist Minnesota businesses and to assist industry uh, in trying to move initiatives forward and to do product development and assist them uh, but we have been without a full-time meat scientist since 2017. Uh, from that time period, we have uh, used our food scientists that we have on staff to, to fill gaps and to work with clients uh, to help them uh, navigate through some of the challenges that they face. Uh, but it really doesn't provide that same level of service as we've seen in the past uh, in terms of what we can do with that, that base knowledge of a meat scientist. Uh, and in our Marshall facility, we do have assets in place uh, already. We have a, a, a meat product lab where we can do fabrication and cutting. We have a smokehouse. Um, uh, we have the, the refrigerated space there as well. Uh, so we are well set up and, and what we're just lacking is um, someone uh, on staff full time to really try to move this forward. Uh, so as we looked at what's been going on in the, the industry, we did um, contract with a third party, third party to do an industry assessment in 2020. Uh, where they reached out to 15 industry stakeholders from uh, processors to industry reps to our commodity associations uh, just to better understand their needs and, and make sure that we are doing something that would, would really service the industry. Uh, and that was a, a resounding yes that they had missed uh, ARI's capabilities in this space, uh, especially in the areas of product and marketing assistance, uh, in terms of uh, product formulation, in terms of being able to do those the short courses uh, or those demonstration sites for fa fabrication and cutting. Uh, and what we're really seeing is a lot of need and scale up assistance, as well as in just uh, questions around facilities and investments uh, and things that, that uh, um, having someone with that expertise on staff could really help navigate some of those challenges that our small meat processes are facing uh, as they look at growing their businesses, as they, as they see increased demand uh, with, uh, with the local food movement, as we had just heard um, from uh, the <coughs> uh, movement as well. Uh, also, we uh, provide input on HACCP plans or hazard analysis critical control points and just help them navigate through that process and all the inspection needs. Uh, and then um, the other thing that we heard a lot was, was just having a, an organization for uh, providing a, a site where equipment manufacturers or equipment needs could be tested, looked at, uh, come in and have a, a, a place uh, where those types of demonstrations can occur uh, for, uh, for looking at some of those new investments that, uh, that um, groups might want to make. Uh, and then finally, we've collaborated in the, in the, in the past with many um, uh, partners uh, in this space, and we would continue to do that in terms of uh, workforce development, uh, training courses, uh, certification programs, elements like that, that we know continue to be in need uh, out there for, for this industry. Uh, just uh, in, in addition, we had done a 2013 study that also showed, uh, um, uh, I think, reinforced a lot of the findings that we, we found here in 2020 as well that have carried through. Um, so it's great to get a couple of touch points in terms of what the need uh, for the industry is. And I'll just add that even um, uh, without a meat scientist, we continue to, to service that industry. As I said, we've seen anywhere from 25 to 35 projects come through in the last three years. Uh, but I think what we're missing are, are those larger industry initiatives 
uh, where we just don't have the uh, the background base to to really try to move those opportunities forward uh, and really uh, move the dial, I think, for the industry in terms of what uh, what we'd like to do in terms of creating new opportunities for value-added agriculture in Minnesota. Uh, so with that, um, again, these funds would, pro would provide um, funding for a full-time hire and advancing programs and initiatives uh, in the meat science space. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll just say we greatly appreciate the partnership with Minnesota legislature over the last 30 years uh, to try to advance um, value-added opportunities for, for the industry, uh, for our producers, our entrepreneurs, and our small businesses uh, across the spectrum. And I appreciate your consideration of this request. Thank you, Mr. Sledge. I apologize earlier too, uh, and, and for butchering your name as well. Um, <laughs> any, any questions to the witnesses or author? Okay, seeing none, um, I don't see any amendments submitted. Uh, so see no further discussion. Uh, Chair Sundin, do you have any closing comments uh, before you renew your motion? I, I do. You know, we, we do a lot of good things in this committee for promoting agriculture. And uh, who would ever thought we'd be talking about growing uh, or fish, you know, fish farms and some of the uh, different uh, uh, topics that we take up. But uh, this is a real meat and potatoes issue. So I renew my motion that 2037 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus ag finance bill. Thank you, Chair Sending. With that, House File 2037 is laid over. Um, and uh, I'll bring the gavel back to Mr. Chair for any announcements. We're adjourned.